Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yo, 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 Dad, what's up? What's up? Has this past week been going? Uh, my week has been really interesting. Yeah. I don't know if you saw what I posted on Twitter Thursday. Oh, you know what? I saw that the, I think I saw it the day after because I was sleeping because I've been sick, so I've been taking NyQuil. But I did see that um that your car situation, right? That's what you're talking yes. about. Yes, yeah, my car bad. got vandalized. Uh, John and I decided to go out for dinner Thursday. It was a restaurant we had been wanting to go to for a long time um, because, you know, the re- it's always booked. They yeah. only take reservations the first day of the month, and, like, they are uh, always gone within minutes. And so uh, okay. we finally got one because we were on, like, a list to if somebody canceled, they notify you. Okay. So we it's an early dinner as well. It was like a 545 dinner. We parked. We were late for the dinner. And <laughs> so we parked in front of this church, a well-lit church. You would think like, oh, we're going to be good. It's also early in the afternoon or evening. Mm-hmm. We get back to the car at like 750, you know, close to two hours later. I jump in the car because I don't notice anything. And then John is like, <laughs> and I'm like, what? And, you know, he sees, he points to like some writing on the car and it was, it had been raining. So I could hardly see what it said. So I kind of wiped. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I couldn't make out the first word, but I could make out the other two words. It said something about doing something bad to kids. I'll just say mm-hmm. that. Yeah, so the image. Um, and. Then I was like, oh, that's so messed up. So I'm about to, I walk back around, mm-hmm. uh, about to get in the car. And he was like, but look, and our front tire was all <laughs> flashed. Yeah, that's crazy. So it's raining. We're stuck in the rain. We end up waiting for over three hours for the tow truck. We called the police twice. Okay. They never came. <laughs> oh, my God. Because, you know, we wanted to file a police report for mostly for insurance. We know they're probably not going to catch whoever it was. Of course, yeah. And um, so we the tow truck came and towed it to the dealership or whatnot. And we took an Uber home. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the next day after the tire was fixed, uh, because we have to wait for the body work. The dealership doesn't do that type of thing. Okay. Um. And, you know, the dealership, if if you take it there, they like clean up the car and stuff like that. And so it was very apparent (laughs) what that first word was. Uh And it was just like, we cannot drive the car with that message on it. No, that's that's wild. It's kind of like a it it raised my anxiety because one, I did call the church that we were parked in front of. Like, do you guys have any cameras? And, you know, they were like, no, but they did tell us that there were reports that multiple cars had been vandalized. Mm. But it's just kind of like a, if we're randomly driving down the street with that message on our car, ain't nobody going to think that this was like a random was, act yeah. of vandalism. Yeah. They're going to be like, <laughs> yeah. to a child. Not, not and safe. They might attack us or they yeah. might damage our car further. So it's like... It's kind of like scary um, and anxiety inducing. We can't actually get the car fixed until mid-May. So we'll just be without that car for like more than a month. Oh, wow. That's Yeah, that was a wild story when I seen that. Um, And now even hearing about it from you uh, makes it even wilder. Because the fact is, too, that uh, thinking of when this took place, like you said, it was an early early dinner. Mm -hmm. The sun is still up. Like there's still light outside, even up until the point where y'all got out around, you like said, 750 or so. The sun is just now going down. So this person did this, slashed the tires, wrote, keyed the cars <laughs> while people can actually see them, which is kind of like, okay, what kind of mindset would this person in to do be to be that brazen to do something like that? Um, where folks can clearly see um as well. So yeah, that, that's a that's a crazy situation. I'm glad, you know, it didn't. It wasn't worse. Um, I know the car situation is definitely annoying, and I'm sure that took 
you know, waiting for the police, tow trucks, all that kind of stuff takes a long time. That's <laughs> not a quick, a quick trip by any means. And it says a lot to that. I called the police twice and they didn't, they didn't show up. Um, you know, that's par for the course. I think a lot of stories we hear about with, when it comes to law enforcement, even though this wasn't like a, you know, of course, at a, I'm sure it wasn't a high priority situation. At the end of the day, you would still expect at least somebody to, yeah. to come, come patrolling through. I think it's also because it was like raining. They probably didn't want to get out of the car. But I, I don't know because I don't want to like say it was somebody else's fault. But John was like, because there was an event going on at the church while we okay. were there. Okay. So John did a little detective work and was like, what was going on? There was a rehearsal dinner for a wedding at the church during that time. So okay. did they vandalize a bunch of cars thinking they might be attending the rehearsal? Was it a random act of yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Look, one do, one thing we do know about crime, it's all about proximity. So somebody in that vicinity definitely committed that offense. It wasn't somebody coming from, you know, blocks away. It was somebody who was there and had the time to do this to several cars, right? Um, yeah, that wasn't, it was either somebody, yes, very close or probably somebody who was at there. Who knows, right? Um, but I wouldn't, that's not a far-fetched assumption by any means, so. Yeah. Shout out to John. I don't know. The, the, person, the, the groom is a teacher as well. So it's just like, oh. I'm trying to. <laughs> not saying they would, but it's just kind of like, I, I, I don't know. People are wild out here. So. No, no, for sure. For How sure. was your week? Um, you know, my week was was pretty normal. Uh, nothing, nothing that uh, extreme happened to me. Uh, good news, my my nephew has been brought to this earth. My brother and my sister in law had their child, so it's the first uh, boy of the next generation of Connor. So that's that's funny. Um, or not funny, but we're happy about that. Um, <laughs> Jace Jace Connor is his name, um, and so he is nice, strong, and healthy, um, looking just like his daddy. So. Um, they're still in the hospital. Should be home in the next day or two. You know how it usually is, but they just had him um, a, a day and a half ago. It was like late, late, late Friday night. So, um, so that's been exciting. You know, when a new baby's in the family, you know that's always the the news of the week for us. Um, and outside of that, just been trying to get over this little head cold I've been having. So, you might hear it in my voice, listeners, uh, a little stuffy. So bear with me. <laughs> this, yeah, this did you episode. test yourself? I, I didn't test myself because it's literally just congestion. I haven't had like a lot of other crazy things like that's what they all say for real. Like <laughs> yeah. I did I did cancel my classes on Friday <laughs> to to be safe because I didn't want to you know in case I had any infection like that pass along to my students. So I was being responsible. I'm just messing um, with you. Oh no 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 Kinda. I get you. No I know I know. <laughs> 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 but I did, you know, and now, you know, my students, they weren't complaining. I definitely wasn't complaining either. Yeah. I had to get up Friday morning. Um, so, yeah, so that's been it really. Just the same old welcome the new member to our family and counting down every week. I say it's counting down the days to the end of this semester. Um, so, yeah, I'm happy about that. Yes, I cannot believe I only have three more classes yet left. But also, welcome, Jace. We're happy to have you. Yes, welcome, Jace. Welcome, Jace. Uh, maybe one day he'll be on the podcast. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, uh, uncle uh, or niece and nephew episode. Niece and nephew episode. Have them come in and talk about their little lives in elementary school or what have you. Um, but yeah, that'll be funny. We'll see if we're still, hopefully, you know, BHD still going around that time, but we never know. But if it is for sure, that would be a cool, funny little episode to have them on. I know, I've seen other podcasters do that have their kids on and talk about <laughs> things that interest you. I'm sure those podcast episodes can be you know, who knows what these kids are interested in at that time. Yeah, they say the darndest things. Of course. I remember that show. Yeah. Did you ever watch the remake with Tiffany Haddish? No. No, I didn't watch it either. Um, but I know they tried to bring it back. It didn't last long. Uh, yeah. But I know I watched it with, uh, with Bill with Bill Cosby, right? That was, it was Bill originally, right? Well, it was, I think before it was Bill, I think it was, was it Bill Cosby? I don't, I don't know. I, I it was a white guy let's see i feel like it was a white guy before bill like way back and then i think it was bill in the more modern times but i could be wrong maybe it wasn't bill. no you you might be right um yeah it, oh there was a yep bill cosby was the original there was no white guy oh i swear there's a white guy too <laughs> <laughs> So Bill Cosby was the whole time. Okay. Yeah, they did it recently with Tiffany Haddish, yeah. uh, maybe a year or two ago, but it wasn't, it didn't, you know, it didn't pop off the same. Um, but okay. But I think it might 
B wait, no, there was, there was art, art link letter. So okay. there was a version with art link letter, a version with Bill Cosby, and then a okay. version with, t- cause I'm like, I do remember. I remember white guy. <laughs> so we were wrong. Okay. That's good. That's good. Random, random BHD facts for y'all. Okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's get to some old Lord news, and then Daph and I have a special, uh, you know, special topic, topical episode we've been doing, uh, but we'll get to that after we cover some old Lord news. So let's get that going, then we'll be back with y'all in a second. Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening old Lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say... Where do I start? So uh, speaking of illness, uh, but in this case, COVID-19, did you hear that two Biden cabinet members were among a string of positive COVID-19 cases after an elite gridiron dinner? No, I didn't hear about this. Mm -hmm. Yep. I heard Nancy Pelosi, right? I think she had COVID or tested positive for it, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I know Merrick Garland did. Okay. And he's attorney general, of course. And mm-hmm. then come secretary, Jenna Raimondo. Okay. Uh, but it was like 14 people and they expect more cases to emerge. Um, okay. So, yeah. Yeah, I've been seeing different reports every every other day. Somebody getting COVID in you know the pol- political world, so... I don't know what's going on, but maybe it's those dinners, those super spreader events that we've seen before. I know Shanghai and China has like they're going through another massive lockdown, um, similar to at the start of COVID. So, you know, this this thing is still here, y'all. Still here. Yeah, it is actually seeing because the first reports were like fourteen on Thursday, but child, the latest one I see actually said fifty three. Oh wow! Yeah. And this is the and you're talking about politics, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. politicians and stuff. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, no, that's. Yeah, that's, somebody spread that around. But yeah, it's probably one of those big events and everything is super relaxed, as we talked about here yeah. on the podcast before. So it's no surprise. They required vaccination cards, but did not require testing beforehand. So, OK, yeah, that's the thing. So the testing is more important than the, than the cards at this point. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. mm-hmm. the uh, vaccination is just for yourself. Like that's just protecting you. Uh, yeah. but it's not really protecting everybody else. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, speaking of politics, and you mentioned this guy just a couple weeks ago, Herschel Walker, who's running for the Senate seat in Georgia. Mm-hmm. Chow. Oh, what do you do now? A recent poll says that he narrowly leads Raphael Warnock oh, in the election. <laughs> no way. Yes, yes. He's still got a lot of time, though, right? Because this is until, what, November so there's a lot that can change, but that's still kind of wild to, yeah. see, to see that. Yeah, it was 49% to 45% of likely voters. Mm, okay. Uh, well, um, you know, we'll keep keep us updated on that, but that cannot happen. Herschel Walker is too much of a <laughs> wild card out there. Um, and I can only imagine if he gets a Senate seat, what kind of things he'd be promoting out there in Georgia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, still on the topic of politics. Mm-hmm. Um, so you did hear that the student loan uh, repayment has been extended Respect. until August 31st, which is such a weird date because it's right before the midterms. I thought that if they were going to extend it, they were going to do it until after the midterms. Yeah, that makes the most sense. Um, But... Democrats might still be in trouble because a Boston Globe article um, recently released noted that uh, more than a dozen voters uh, with significant student loans said that their debt was weighing on them and that they considered it was shaping how they were considering voting in November uh, and in some Mm -hmm. cases whether they would vote at all. I'm not surprised. Um, this has been a big thing, a big promise of the Democrats, particularly Joe Biden and his administration when he was getting into office. 
um, trying to tackle those student loans. And so the fact that all you've been doing is delaying it isn't really what folks want. We want them to go away. (laughs) And honestly, if they don't come, I've heard this and a lot of public conversations, private conversations, like folks feel that same way. Like if y'all not coming through, then why are we going to come through for you? Um, Why are we going to trust any promises that you're going to say from that point forward? If you couldn't even get something like this accomplished. Now we've heard rumblings that they are working very hard to try to get something. And I feel like, like you mentioned, they probably, have that new deadline because hopefully they plan to do something big before then, then that deadline won't matter. And that will really save them. Like, okay. Cause it's a political strategy as we know. So we're, we're expecting them to do something big right before midterms. Cause the more you do something like that, people will be happy. People are like, yes, yes, let's go. Let's go vote. You can excite the voting populace and then, you know, things are working your favor. So if you do it too early, then, you know, if you do it now, then it's still months away. People that has that lag effect. So we'll see. So that's what if you're a strategist and a part of the Democratic Party, please do something like that. Let us have something to be happy about going into the midterms. Otherwise, like you said, it's going to be a bleak, bleak um, outcome for the Democrats coming up. Mm-hmm. All kind of anticipating already. They better have some surprise planned. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they about to be in trouble. Uh, mm-hmm. Trouble. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't know what you have. Um, in terms of well, me. I mean, on politics too. I guess um, we can also shout out, you know, to uh, um, the new Supreme Court Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. We give a round of applause for that. <laughs> hey. That's really, really, really big. And you know what? I'll be honest. For a moment, I was like, you know, Democrats, they love them a good symbolic victory. But Mm -hmm. with her being on the Supreme Court, she's only 51 years old. This could actually be a real win, Mm -hmm. depending on, like, how various cases go in the future. Unfortunately, she already said she recused herself from the like Harvard affirmative action cases and stuff like that, which I don't feel like she should have. Like if she should not, (laughs) if Clarence Thomas is not going to recuse himself, like no girl from all that mess. Yep. Um, but you know, I I, I guess it is more than a symbol and, you know, congratulations to her because that's really big. First black woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, really, really big. That's history. Um, you know, uh, we've seen, the first, I saw somebody make a post. We've seen the first black first lady in the Obama administration, Michelle Obama. And then we've seen the first black woman who was vice president of the United States. And now we're seeing the first black woman who's Supreme Court justice. We just, you know, for these past 10 or so years, 12 years, however long it's been, we've been seeing a lot of black history and a lot of black women making this history. So that's, you know, that's great to see. Um, it's very sad to see in one instance because it's 2022 for this to be the first in this entire nation's history. Um, but it's still history nonetheless. And I know that was really exciting for her and her family and all the work she's done to be recognized in that manner. Mm-hmm. And I guess you got you know, got to give some, you know, kudos to definitely Joe Biden and because he was stood firm on that and said, you know, I will um, make sure the nominee is a black woman to get in there. And, and he accomplished that. And so history is made. And that's a, definitely a, a notch on his belt of some congratulations. <laughs> yes, because, yeah, you he was going to be in trouble. Because, <laughs> I mean, you when people pull through for you, you follow through on your promises. Mm-hmm. 100 percent. 100 percent. So I have, I have a couple of little new stories. One, this funny story, because um, I think it's it's Lent. Right now, I don't know all the proper dates, but I know Easter's coming up, so I know Lent is usually right before that. Um, And the Chicago area church said that they were going to be fasting from uh, whiteness (laughs) this Lent. How how you do that? (laughs) Which I thought was hilarious. And uh, ironically enough, this is a a white church, uh, a church led by a white pastor. Oh, Uh, (laughs) So, so what they're trying, what he said he's trying to do is essentially just um, prioritize black people, black voices and blackness. So the way they're fasting from whiteness is that all the praise and worship songs will be uh, black songs from, you know, black gospel artists, et cetera. And they're going to not listen to any of their typical, you know, white praise and worship songs for the entire Lent. Um so that was interesting uh, just to see that headline and saying that, you know, they're trying to be more inclusive and intro- make sure his congregation is introduced to other voices and um, approaches, et cetera, et cetera, outside of just the white gaze. Which I thought was interesting. 
also think it's going to be very interesting too because I've been to white churches, I've been to black churches, and those those musical selections are very much different. So now, see well, about to who's going to perform these black musical different these <laughs> these black musical songs in this white church? Are you going to have black artists do it, or are you going to have your white artists do it? It's going to be. Um, I thought that's funny thinking about how that's going to look too uh, when they do that. But yeah. Yeah, I must say praise and worship was always my favorite part of church. Of course. Uh, <laughs> they church going to be lit and they might continue to at least fast in that way. Because <laughs> uh, it's going to be lit. I can see that. I can see that. Like, you know, what? let's keep let's keep some of, the, some of these songs in our, um, our little playlist, uh, even post Lent. I can definitely see that. But that's funny seeing that headline. So shout out to them uh, being more inclusive and, and fasting from whiteness. Um. We saw that Will Smith, just update on that, he has been banned from the Academy for the next 10 years. How you feel about that, Dev? Yeah. Um, I, it seems excessive. But, I mean, Oscar's been so white for a long time. I remember that we had this conversation I'm pretty sure it was like 2015. There was the hashtag like Oscar so white. Mm-hmm. That's 2016. I, yeah, I have been it. been like uh, watching them. Yeah, it was 2016. Yeah, I I haven't been watching for a while. Not that I'm like boycotting over him, but it's just like that award show is is not made for black people anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, they want to talk about like travesties at the Oscars. I was reading about how I think it was um, Hattie McDaniel, maybe, um, was uh, not allowed to even, like, attend uh, Mm. when she won her award for, like, Gone with the Wind. I think it was... um, Oh, yeah, because she said about about Native Americans, right? No, no. So this was the Black woman from Gone with the Wind. Okay. Hattie McDaniel won. She was the first Black Oscar winner. But she wasn't even allowed to she either wasn't allowed to attend or she was made to like sit in a very, very back so nobody could see her. Oh, wow. And then, yes, I think in the 70s or 80s, there was the incident with the Native American woman who came on stage and I think was talking about a Clint Eastwood movie and. Mm-hmm. I can't remember who it was. John Wayne. Yeah, I had to be like held back by six security guards because he wanted to Mm -hmm. go on stage to attack her or Mm -hmm. how Harvey Weinstein was still awarded three years after, you know, he fled the country. So it's just kind of like, we're not going to talk about Oscar travesties. Mm So mm, I'll just just leave that there. No, agreed. I thought it was excessive. Like when I saw 10 years, I was like, dang. Damn, 10 years, that's that's OD. Um, but if we also think about how long it took him to actually get an Oscar, right? It's been probably much, much longer than that. So it's not even like, yeah, probably going to give him another one in the next 10 years because um, we know how the Oscars are. Um, but yeah, I thought it was excessive. You know, um, he already resigned. Not that there shouldn't be a penalty. I think you do need to set some boundaries. Like, listen, y'all just can't be up here smacking folks. You know, but unfortunately, we know when it comes to black folks being the example they're going to be pretty severe. Uh, but we already seen it, especially with Harvey Weinstein. Like, I mean, come on, like this man should have been banned for life with those accusations and, and what happened with him. Uh, but yet somebody like Will, you know, we see that. So he should have been the first person where we've seen an example set a hundred percent. But like you said, it is what it is. It's not an award show for us. I can't wait until, I don't know, you know, we come up, the black community comes up with just, and our award shows, I know we have our like NAACP Image Awards and stuff like that, but sometimes we don't treat them as prestigious as these white awards, but we need to get to that point. And that's going to be, it's going to change the game because ain't nobody going to be wanting to watch, you know, all the all the Oscars and stuff. And I know, um, I think it was, uh, what's his name in Houston? Um, I can't remember his name now, an OG in Houston who was, t- who was getting, talking about telling the artists like Kanye because how the Grammys banned Kanye. Um, so he was like, look, Kanye, Drake, and calling all the big names and saying, you know, let, let's perform, let's do a live show at the same time the Grammys is happening, right? And watch what happens, right, with all these top music artists. I think he called Beyonce as well. Um, of course, it didn't It didn't happen. But when we start having those ideas, like, you know, well, let's start competing. Have our own separate award shows that we feel just prestigious. Compete with these white award shows and let's see where the ratings go, where the talent is, where the shows are, where the characters and the charisma are. We already know what's going to happen. I think we need to start empowering our own communities instead of just kind of 
begging these white folks to let us in and give us these awards so we can feel good. No, we can make ourselves feel good like we do every day. Um, and I, I can't wait till we get to that point. I feel like it's coming because when we see things like this, and it's like you said, 2016 with Oscar So White and also with the Golden Globes, I think this past one, it was a lot of convers- conversation because there were like not many black nominees and like no nobody black won at all. So it's like, listen, they're going to keep doing this. And I think this is why the Oscars did what they did of having, you know, the, the, the host that they had and, um, you know, Quest Love and then winning because they saw what happened to Golden Globe. Like, we can't have this happen to us again. But they're not thinking about this unless something happens. Then they react. They're more reactive instead of being proactive. So mm-hmm. let's create our own. I'm all for it when y'all do that. Agree. Um, okay, and then saw this other story. I just, you know, we've been talking about health. You know, trying to try, both been losing weight, trying to be in shape, et cetera, et cetera. I saw this study. It just came out. It says just a new study shows that sugary drinks um, can are linked to increased cancer risk. Um, I just wanted to draw that out there. You know, they're saying a lot of these sugary drinks that come from uh, like McDonald's and stuff like that from these fast food res- restaurants. Um, there's like a direct issue that they're, they're finding, but don't really know yet with artificial sugars and things of that nature. So, you know, I just wanted to, I know we already, most folks already know kind of a good understanding of the issues with sugary drinks and maybe think diabetes, obesity, et cetera, just sugar in general. But now it could be linked to things like cancer, which is even also very severe, another severe de- disease. So, you know, try to do all you can to try to stay away from as much as possible and, you know, just drink water. It's, can never go wrong with that. I- Actually, I think I've heard that before or like so from like cancer survivors, um, one in particular who was like very vocal about it. I don't know. if Did you ever watch Married to Medicine? Mm-hmm. Dr. Mm-hmm. Jackie, mm-hmm. how I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I from what I understand, like she like completely cut like refined sugars and any sugar like out of her diet because it. I, I feel like I've heard about like the the sugars can like feed the like cancer make it. Mm. And so, I mean, you saw how like strict she was with the way yeah. like with food and stuff like that. And I yeah, feel like was that was potentially her way of feeling in control of like making sure it doesn't come back. Doing all you can to make sure you don't have to go do that again. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure it's a very scary thing. And a lot of times, yeah, when folks, I know folks who have autoimmune, folks with cancer, these, when they beat it, they come back with this completely new approach about how they approach their diet and food. And so I'm sure they learn a lot going through that process because I'm sure the doctor's like, hey, you got to stay away from X, Y, and Z. And then once you go through it, you're like, you know what? If this caused this terrible experience, I never, you know, you traumatize to an extent, but you never want to go through that again. And it makes a lot of sense. And this American food system is just terrible. You know, it was just every time, every other week, I find myself questioning, like, why is it why can I get a whole meal for five dollars at a restaurant, a like fast food restaurant? And then if I want fruits and vegetables, you know, that's going to be like twenty dollars. Right. Like it's just like there's not a balance. It's so the way our system is set up is so much easier to get this, this terrible food items and processed food and sugary foods and drinks. Um, and that sort of stuff is so, so cheap compared to the stuff that actually will. But a lot of, you know, you can go to a whole lot of conspiracy theories as far as like with private health care. And this is what our country wants. Right. They want people to be dependent on the system. That's how they continue to make money instead of being preventative, which every doctor says is the best approach. Uh, it's just sad to see, you know, our system just setting up people for failure. But, you know, we've been doing a good job and uh, being more conscious. I think over these past few years, I could see a lot of my peers and, and friends just, you know, being more conscious of our, our, our eating habits. So mm-hmm. that's good for the future and future generations, too, because we'll teach our kids this from from the jump. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I've been on the health kick and I think for the rest of the month, I am going to try to see if I can cut because I have found healthy, quote, healthy snacks. Mm-hmm. And I just I binged most of those after <laughs> and Thursday. And so I'm like, you yeah. know what? It might be a good time to see if I can just do the whole food approach for the rest of the month since I, I just ate all my because <laughs> I was stressed out. <laughs> Stress will do that to you. Stress will do that to you. You just got you all of a you got the munchies and you just go and go and hang. <laughs> That's funny, but yeah, it's a good approach. Good approach. That's I said, at least being I feel like just being aware and conscious, it's just already a better outcome where we know we can, you know, okay, you know, we ate, we ate like this. Now let me chill out for for a little bit and, and reset my body. That's much um, you know, a really solid approach for us, you know, having long, long lasting lives is the goal, is the goal. <laughs> 
Um, I saw this really uh, last story. Um, this I saw this going around social media, so I decided just to talk about it. This COVID study came out, and it says new study finds that glasses wearers are at lower risk for COVID nineteen. <laughs> um, a new a new study finds that people who wear glasses are less likely to commit, uh, uh, contract COVID nineteen. Uh, this says the revelation comes after a study conducted by Virus Watch. For more than 19,000 participants in England and Wales responded to this questionnaire about uh, glasses and contact lenses. Um, and I think this started around 2022, this particular study. Um, and it says that 11,000 people shared monthly blood samples to prove whether or not they have been infected with the coronavirus. And after taking a bunch of risk factors into account, they said those who wore glasses had a 15 percent lower risk of infection than those who did not wear the glasses. Um, the study was also seen in India as well, a, comp- a comparable study, and they found similar similar results too. Um, and they said it's just because you just have extra protection, and so you're not as likely to touch your eyes and stuff like that because we know, you know, getting into the eyes, the mouth, the nose, and so just having that extra letter, layer of protection serves to be, you know, some use for those of us who uh, wear glasses and folks who probably got fun of wearing glasses. Now you, the joke's on those folks who don't wear glasses. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you know, I can see that because I know in the hospital, they'll wear like the the protective eye gear. Yeah, like the goggles and stuff. So yeah. when I have on my mask outside, one, oh, it does bother me because like my glasses always get steamed up sometimes and I have to like, uh, but I, that's good to know because really the only thing that's uncovered usually is my forehead. Yeah. Yeah, so it's good. So you're extra protected, extra 15% with the glasses. So can never go wrong with a little extra protection. Now that I know that, I'll probably start wearing that when I'm out and about going to the grocery store and stuff. Yeah. I still keep my mask on um, everywhere I go when I'm not home. And I still teach my mask on and all that stuff. So um, that's been good. Okay. And then um, last quick story is just for those of you who might be looking for jobs. I don't know if you saw this, Dev, but... A lot of these major companies who have a CDF, you have a CDL, a lot of these major companies are paying bank. Uh, Walmart said they are looking for new commercial um, drivers to help drive their trucks for long hauls. And they said they're starting out salaries with $110,000. And I think Amazon came out as well saying they're starting with about $95,000 for their long haul trucking. So we know because there's been a lot of issues with with deliveries and uh, shortages, et cetera, that a lot of these companies who really their bread and butters with deliveries are now looking for drivers and they are paying a high premium. So if any of you are looking for a job or know anyone, please definitely uh, go get that quick check and make some good money uh, for these major companies. Yes. I was about to say, so I just actually had this conversation um, with a friend because uh, somebody that they're really close to just got their CDL license and just got a, really great job with a nice salary and there are actually he was able to actually get his cdl paid for and Uh, there's some i'll I'll have to ask because i think my sister knows about it there was some program that he was able to go through go through like the cdl like schooling and licensure and stuff like that get it for free and now he has like a really great job so i'll see nice. if i can find out about that and put the the link in the episode oh yeah no that's good that's good and so so hey i know the pandemic hit a lot of folks and this might be an opportunity where it's not like you know so it's, it's a well-paying job and you you and your family could be really good if, if there's something you need so that's why i just wanted to quickly mention that i'm glad you mentioned that too Dev programs where CDLs can be paid for. I'm sure they have that. If there's a shortage, I'm sure these companies too are also like, hey, we'll pay you to get this <laughs> certification <laughs> if you come on down. So um, so I think it's a good opportunity uh, for folks looking for that. Uh, but okay, those are all the stories that I had. So um, today, as we mentioned earlier, our topical episode is going to be talking about police violence and um, particularly against uh, black women, women of color, uh, you know, uh, this is, you know, derivative of Say Her Name campaign. And we just want to take some time to really highlight and look into some of the, the research and, and a history of uh, what, what has been happening here. Because we know that when these police brutality cases happen and typically it's the stories of black men who get, you know, portrayed all around the media and those stories of black women, we hear a little love. And so we just you know kind of being proactive in a sense because we know there hasn't been a major case right which is good which is what we want to see but also take some time to remind folks that these things do happen 
and that we should continue to say their names or say her names when um, these issues of police violence come up and not have their stories be forgotten or you no know, silence. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, in addition to talking about the origins of say her name and the purpose, you know, we talk about some statistics around, you know, police violence against black women. Um, we even, you know, a part of the segment, we say her name and we talk about some of the stories that you probably haven't heard of. Yes, 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 yes. So. Um, we will move forward with that. The rest of the episode will be an audio version. So uh, for our YouTube viewers, go ahead and check the rest of the episode out on uh, audio and uh, tell us what you think. Um, and then we will catch up with y'all next week. Take care. Okay, Dad. So, you know, as we discussed, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, police violence and black women in particular. Um, so I think, you know, it's probably important to at least talk about or mention or begin with uh, the whole movement of, of say her name. What do you think? Yeah, I think that that completely makes sense. Um, you know, I was actually wondering for you, like what comes to mind when you hear or even when you first like learned about the hashtag say her name, like what came to mind? Yeah, you know, I think this is why these kind of things um, and this form of social movement is is important um, because I can pro- I can really say that I did not until say, until say her name came about, I really didn't like stop and pause and think about what was missing from these conversations. Um, we hear these cases, but of course, all the popularized cases, you know, from Michael Brown, Eric Garner, right, George Floyd, everybody, predominantly black men. And so when it first came around and we started hearing, I was like, oh, wait, this is real true. Like, I know this happens to black women, but I never hear about it. Um, so that to me really was eye opening. And since, okay, you know what? Let me pay more attention to these cases with black women, or at least be an advocate for more of these stories to be told than just black men. How about you? Yeah. So I would say for me, like when I hear say her name, I immediately think of like Sandra Bland. I mm-hmm. feel like a lot of the times when we think about movements against police violence, we often center a conversation about like one or two very memorable cases. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in the public imagination and in the black community, often some of the most memorable cases, maybe because of like the outrage that was sparked by the case have been like black men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this hashtag speaks to the importance of intersectionality and, you know, knowing even your background, you know, as somebody that studies crim and I'm pretty sure these are things, you know, but like actually reflecting Mm -hmm. after you heard the hashtag to say, Hmm, we don't really talk about these cases as much. And we often don't even know about them. Nope. Nope. I think and that and that that pause, even when you say like talk about these things, like say her name and it causes you to pause and think it really goes to show how much media we consume and it can you know make us feel one type of way, whether you're for or against it or just raising awareness. But it, we rarely question what we're consuming. Like, is this the whole story? Is this all perspectives, all experiences? Right. Are there more things that we should be taking into consideration? And so that's why I like I fell into that just looking at the news media. The seeing the outrage, being a part of the outrage, but then not even taking a step back. But hey, who's there's someone's story who's not getting told here um, that should be. And so even like you said, being into this field and knowing a good amount of information, not all, uh, but just still how the media and public popular media just uh, influenced me in that regard. So it's really powerful. That's a really powerful <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because I was on 538, you know, that website that like mm-hmm. has all the statistics and stuff. And, you know, they were, I guess, tracking news coverage of uh, media attention related to black women mm-hmm. fatally shot. Mm-hmm. Yep. And very rarely, it seems like Micaiah Bryant, um, the two, 2021 case got the absolute most articles followed by like mm-hmm. Brianna Taylor. But other than that, it's like very minimal coverage. Yeah. Very minimal. Um, I think they have a chart on there and it's a graph that really shows um, the differences between George Floyd and Brianna Taylor. Cause they were um, killed, uh, I think around the same time within days from one another. Um, and the media coverage 
uh, of George Floyd. I think on they had on it's within sixty days from like May twenty fifth and forward. George Floyd had twenty two thousand articles. Um, Wow. Reported, yeah, they like did that twenty two thousand articles. And you look at the track, the graph. I actually don't see the number for Breonna Taylor, but it is just so if you guys can't see the graph, it is probably a a fifth of that, like uh, or maybe like five percent of what George Floyd had is what Breonna Taylor had as far as the media coverage. It is a massive, dramatic difference um, in that mm-hmm. sixty day period. Um, that's that's that 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 graph really stands out to me because like you visually see like how much a case about a man gets covered and then how even though we, and it's funny because we really knew about Breonna Taylor and that became popularized as well, but nowhere near to the extent of someone like George Floyd, which touched just way more people. Yeah, even her like little, so we'll share this article, but even looking at her one little spike towards like September, or October, it still never reached Never the, the points, uh, some of the heights and coverage for George Floyd. And mm-hmm. I think one thing, I'm sure I want to emphasize and I'm sure to well want to emphasize this is not that other cases should not get the coverage, but it's raising the question of why don't cases related to black women, whether it be police violence. I feel like there's also been a movement of like missing black women and, you know, black women who have just disappeared, who don't get the same amount of coverage as like white women. So I think mm-hmm. this all speaks to like the the intersectionality piece is like, what is it about black women that, I don't know, they're, they're framed as like less deserving um, or less interesting um, cases to explore um these broader social issues yeah i don't know that's like a question i mean i guess i can say i maybe know a little bit but it is just like really intriguing like i said the the amount of outrage you get for black men and you just don't get nearly as much for black women um it says a lot right and even when i bring this stuff up for other black men i i don't think folks really would know how surprised some folks would probably really be surprised of how much opposition these conversations get internally with other black men of like some instances they try to talk about like almost it becomes like a you know oppressive Olympics and things like that. But even within you have this kind of conversations, there's still a lot of pushback of saying like, well, you know, it's X, Y, and Z, or we get killed by the police more, which is, you know, statistically probably true. But and that does not mean that the same outrage shouldn't be there. Like you're not explaining why the media covers it more, why people are likely to protest more and, and do a lot more things and it reached the, the you know the all the way up until the president's office and we just don't see it nearly as much for, for black men. Um, it's hard for folks to explain that. Of course, sociologists, right? We can talk about patriarchy and things like that. Like you say, intersectionality and men just always get more coverage or more um, pr- privilege in that capacity. Uh, but when you ask the you know everyday person, it's, they have a challenging time trying to really determine what the causes may be for the same exact kind of content. Yeah, I'm I'm happy you spoke to like the internal politics around this. I, and that's why I wanted to emphasize earlier that it's not about there needing to be less coverage of a Mm -hmm. case like George Floyd, but that Mm -hmm. let's also give attention to these other stories that speak to the Black experience and the Black narrative, but with a gender component and sometimes a LGBTQIA component. Um, Mm -hmm. And I just think that's important. And I hope we can reach a point where conversations about people with at different intersections of inequality uh, within the black community, like conversations about that, isn't seen as like zero sum in terms of conversations about others. And I think part of this is just how, I guess, the media and how society operates in general when it comes to people with marginalized uh, backgrounds, a lot of times it is zero sum. The media has probably carved out X number of minutes for, you know, particular types of stories. And it's like, Mm -hmm. who are we going to cover? So I think it is broader systems that make these conversations or make resources to combat particular issues, zero sum in the sense that, you know, 
we're only going to give up this much of the pie to this particular type of issue. And you guys are just going to have to like figure it out amongst yourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a part of the issue. Yeah, that's part of the issue for sure. And, you know, in, in news media outlets, I know they get a lot of flack, but just like politicians almost, they're going to talk about what people care about. And so if they put these stories out and they see these stories aren't getting hits or retweets or shared or whatever it is compared to these stories with black men, then, you know, a part of that is on like just folks like us too. Um, like if you want to see more of it or um, raise awareness more, but I think, you know, just like you would see a story or comment or use a hashtag when it's a black man, you know, that same kind of um, energy needs to be put for when it's a black woman. And then they'll, then they'll talk about it more because they know it's going to get more views and people are caring about it. But it's like, yeah, something generally speaking, societally speaking, it's like uh, the general public doesn't seem to care as much. Even when we talk about like debates, even opposition, right? It's usually more conversations around that when it comes to black men um, for folks who might be like super pro police or whatever stance they may have than we see with black women. Um, and it just, I mean, these examples just really speak to why, you know, say her name really needs to be um, even more discussed or is actually needed because a situation like this, just the apparent invisibility of black women. Agreed. Now, what's interesting is that despite the invisibility of black women in coverage related to like the issues they face, you know, the police violence they face, I will, if you look at images of like who out there protesting, regardless of like who the victim mm -hmm. is, I feel like there's always these images of black women, black women at the front of the protest line. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's interesting that the coverage of cases directly impacting black women have less visibility, but black women have a lot of visibility in protest movements around police violence within a black community in general. Yep. No, no, that's real. Um, and yeah, they always, you know, black women have always led the charge with these kind of things. And that's what I find troubling sometimes is like, yes, when it, the, the male, the victim is a black male. And then you, like you said, visually see black women taking charge and pushing for change. And then I just feel like you don't see that same energy, particularly even with black men, um, when it's a black woman who is the victim of this kind of brutality, we don't see that same kind of energy. Um, which I think needs to be discussed more internally, right? With our interracial relations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Cause I think a lot of times when these conversations about interracial relationships between blacks and whites and what gets covered and what doesn't, you know, also black folks, we play a part in this too. And I think it's also important to acknowledge, you know, our shortcomings and limitations and do better for, for black women and not just, you know, ignore it or just point to the white man all the time. You know, there are things that need to be discussed and, and hashed out too within, within our communities. Yeah. You know, I even think about like the founding of Black Lives Matters, which mm -hmm. was organized by three women. Although I will say Black Lives Matter. I feel like there's been a lot of controversy around them lately. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I will. I have to read more. I'm not going to give an opinion on that. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because even on the Black Lives Matters website, you have like these three Black women at the forefront uh, and it was says that the movement and the hashtag was actually sparked by the acquittal of Trayvon Martin's murder, uh, mm -hmm. murderer, George Zimmerman. And so mm -hmm. it's interesting that this movement that was sparked by three black women at the center of it was, I feel like, well, I feel like the Trayvon Martin case really, it, it sparked a lot of like things have been like popped off since then, if, if we're mm -hmm. being real. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, black women starting Black Lives Matter and then black black women starting to say her name, right? Like really killing the hashtag game. And it's kind of um, in this social media age being creative and like really making impactful hashtags and phrases to get folks into action and organize around, which is necessary in this new day and age. And it's cool to see black women just like leading that charge of seeing what's needed, what's missing. Now, here we can uh, make our impact. So I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about say her name before moving forward. Yeah, sure. 
Um, so in general, it was launched in uh, December of 2014 by the African American Policy Forum and the Center for uh, Intersectionality and Social Policy uh, Studies. I believe Kimberly Crenshaw, who is you know mm-hmm. originated the intersectionality, was very instrumental in creating you know this campaign. Say her name, um, and the whole goal of the campaign has been to bring awareness to what they described as the often invisible names and stories of Black women and girls who have been victimized by racist police violence and also to provide support to their families. Yeah. Um, you know, if you go on their website, um, you know, they also, in, when they developed this, I think a year later, they created a report. Um, I don't know if it's called, let's say, say oh yeah, say her name. Yeah. Uh, Resisting Police Brutality Against Black Women. It's like 48 pages, a really good resource. You know, you can see um, they have some data on there talking about some of the cases at the time between 20, 2005, 2007, looking at these cases. Um, that's another thing I'll we'll probably talk about a little bit, too, about like sexual misconduct with policing, too, that I think doesn't go discuss as much. Um, so it's a really great resource. And like you said, Kimberly Crenshaw, you know, definitely one of the more prominent names in the field, uh, taking this and moving it forward and really, you know, getting folks to say their names when it comes to these issues of intersectionality and police brutality yeah. that we don't discuss as much. Agree. And we'll definitely say one thing that I loved about the report is that it, you know, highlighted the stories of so many women mm-hmm. that I had even, you know, never heard of in terms of their oh, yeah. cases. And we will say some of those names um, and highlight some of those stories in this episode. Uh, yes. I don't know if you want to talk more broadly about just some statistics and like before we get into individual stories, just like kind of framing the issue more broadly. Sure, sure. Um, I'll do that using this source. It's a really good source um, from uh, Michelle Jacobs. I'm going to give credit. Um, uh, uh, she wrote an article at the UF University of Florida uh, Law and Scholarship um, Journal. Um, and the title of the article is The Violent State Black Women's Invisible Struggle Against Police Violence. And so in this article, she does a really, really good job. So anybody who's like interested in this topic in general, I think this is an excellent source because it breaks down all the different dimensions of uh, police brutality against black women. And a lot of what we discussed before, the historical implications. Um, one thing that I think is important, what I, I'm happy that she mentioned is looking at talking about like the different reasons why this happens um, and why trying to really explain why black women uh, might be or are invisible with some of these things. And a lot of it has to do with like preconceived notions and stereotypes about, about black women, about all the images we see and how black women are, you know, thought of in a lot of different worlds. So, um, you know, some, some of the topics and examples she gave of like, you know, the, Je- the, the Jezebel stereotype and um, black women having loose morals, right. These things that play out in various different ways and in, in media and in just popular culture conversation, Another one um, is that black women, even uh, and this person, I believe, has a legal background. So looking at the law and stuff like that, how black women are viewed to be mistrustful or liars uh, when it comes to like recounting or telling stories um, or being given testimonies or being witnesses. Um, and, and she says this stems from slavery times as well, that they kind of embedded this myth of the promiscuous black women and that you really can't, you know, being the Jezebel type, you really can never believe what they're saying. They're like natural liars. And so. A lot of times when these cases come out, I believe even with a lot of these popularized cases like we talked about with Breonna Taylor, et cetera, you know, they happen months before anyone gets, before it even gets media attention and somebody gets in and it picks up ways, but it could be three, four months before we even get to the level where we all have actually heard about it for the first time. Um, Another stereotype um, that she addresses is saying that black women being like aggressive and assertive. We hear about this all the time, the angry black woman, which gives more, uh, you know, kind of blaming the victim, right? With police interactions. Well, but what does she do or what does she say? Or maybe I know this happened a lot with the Sandra Bland case, right? Like, uh, why is she talking back to the officer? Like, why can't she just go along with it? You know, all these kind of things to kind of uh, give more evidence or more, I guess, rationale as far as why the police were, quote unquote, supposed to be justified for these actions. And again, that angry black women uh, trope plays a big role in that too. Um, So those are some of the major stereotypes she talked about that I think really do add some, you know, qualitative explanation as far as why folks might not be running to the attention of these, right? Or just maybe rationalizing the behavior of police. If you innately believe these kind of things or these kind of stereotypes, then I can see why folks would, would behave in that way. 
Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Uh, one book that I like uh, think that people should check out if they are interested in kind of the origins of these gendered anti-Black stereotypes um, is uh, Stamped from the Beginning uh, mm. by uh, Ibram X. Kendi. Um, and it's a really awesome book. There's a chapter that I have students read um, at the beginning of class that talks about like the origins of uh, anti-Black stereotypes and anti-Black ideology. And, you know, one of the quotes, so what I, during like reading sessions, one thing that I always have uh, students to do is to pull out quotes that, you know, were really resonant, like that really stood out to them. And almost consistently, one quote that comes out of Kendi's book, uh, it's actually on page 42, if anybody has the book and want to skip to it. Um, it talked about how um, it said, white men continue to depict African women as sexually aggressive, shifting the responsibility of their own sexual desires to the women. Uh, and it talked about like how like these stereotypes go all the way back to like the 1600s, you know, 1700s. And they were used, you know, for functional purposes to shift accountability and responsibility of the acts of these men to the women. And, you know, I can even think about like some of the cases that came up to the reports and how, you know, maybe there were circumstances that put these women in contact with police officers and how people could try to use those circumstances as a justification for the ultimate outcome. Essentially mm -hmm. shifting the responsibility, you know, of the officer to act appropriately, to not escalate the situation and shift it to the women, given whatever reason they may have been in contact with police officers to begin with. Yeah, that, that frustrates me. A lot of the times when we see these kind of cases, it's just like, bro, the officer is trained to be professional, right? Like <laughs> you're a professional representation of the law, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that officers need to be held accountable when they are not de-escalating. I feel like that should be priority and tactic number one in their training. And they should be held legally accountable, especially when these videos arise of them not actively trying to de-escalate through words or through verbal reasoning or communication before it gets physical. A lot of times they are contributing. I know with the Michael Brown case and Darren Wilson, right? Um, Michael Brown, I mean, Darren Wilson was saying like, hey, like they they were cursing at each other, right? They were like using profane language at each other. And he's, Michael Brown said something to him and he said something back to Michael Brown. I'm like, yo, is that acceptable? Like, are we just going to bypass this? Is this acceptable of a what law enforcement officers should do? Again, with Sandra Bland and stuff like that, we see her interaction, we see the officers responding and how they respond, being disrespectful and, and um, being rude as well with profane, profane language, et cetera. I'm like, there needs to be a higher expectation of how law enforcement treats citizens and civilians instead of the other way around. Like, we're supposed to be the professionals and de-escalate ourselves and they're allowed to just go ham and do as they will. So yeah, I agree with you on that, Daph. Like the perspective needs to be changed. As far as accountability, legal accountability, it needs to be put back on the officers. They need to be like calm, cool, and collective all the time, especially if somebody is just verbally saying things to you. There's no reason for you to get hyped, right? Like, but if it's like a physical interaction trying to, you know, you know, fight you or something like that, that's different, right? Then of course you're gonna like get adrenaline rushing, it's gonna be crazy. But if you just mad because somebody you know, called you a pig or something like that. It does not warrant you taking out a gun and shooting somebody. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Um, you mentioned uh, before, you know, you talked about that article. You talked about uh, how the report highlighted for you sexual violence that Black mm -hmm. women face in, in some of these interactions. Do you want to expound on that? Yeah, so that was um, one of the things that um, later in the article um, uh, she was talking about, Michelle was talking about in her article, uh, really just highlighting, like, we also, we address, um, yes, the, you know, this is where intersectionality comes into play, because one, we understand that, like, it's the fatal and lethal uh, encounters between law enforcement and Black men, typically, and in that way, but because of things like intersectionality, right, um, and although Black women get killed at a fewer or lesser rate than black men when we talk about police violence they're also more likely to um, experience sexual assault at the hands of uh, law enforcement that goes 
and and looking at uh, when I was looking at this and looking into it and even in this article and other ways, the interesting thing about this is that this is something that is dramatically underreported because a lot of police uh, departments do not want to keep records of this kind of stuff. And then even if someone were accused of it, for some reason, a lot of these police precincts keep this information confidential. So a lot of these news sources that were like poking and prying and trying to get this information, it wasn't readily available. So like an accurate measure um, is not really out there to statistic wise, as far as trying to figure out like how often this happens, but from a lot of like interactions and conversations and qualitative uh, conversations about this topic, a lot of women, a lot of black women have experienced, um, you know, sexual assaults from law enforcement and they're stopping you, they pull you to the side, um, you know, they're searching you inappropriately, doing some things uh, that, you know, they're not supposed to do, or in some cases asking for sexual favors, right, to not get out of a ticket. Um, so all these kind of things that it's less likely to happen when they're stopping, you know, a male suspect or a victim or what have you, and more likely to happen when you're a woman. So I think a part of this plays a role into it too, because of the invisibility, right? And knowing officers know like, hey, this stuff doesn't get reported. There's no formal structure. So even if she did say something, I'm not going to really get in trouble. It's not going to get investigated as much. So I feel like because we don't know this, this might be happening way more than folks um, know about uh, or, or think about when we talk about uh, police violence in, in this capacity or sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you just think about, you know, sexual assault and sexual violence in general and how it's often underreported, how victims of sexual violence sometimes like self-blame like as if mm -hmm. they were the cause of it and so you think about the power dynamics as it potentially relates to a police officer who might uh sexually violate someone mm -hmm. i mean if that happened to me i would be freaking scared uh, like mm -hmm. of one you you feel like, okay, I have to prove the case. We already know just more generally the way that victims are smeared. And you, we talked about the stereotypes of, of Black women's sexual promiscuity and aggression. Mm -hmm. And you think about like how all of those dynamics might play into someone saying, I'll just, just take it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, all that, yeah, all that stuff, um, yeah, plays plays a big role in this. Um, and often, and then a part of this article too was like linking, you know, just not just the brutality, but also the sexual assaults that a lot of time, and this is, I think we've had these conversations generally about black children as well, black youth, is that it's also the age component. So yes, someone who's younger is definitely gonna be more susceptible to this kind of um, behavior as well because they're more vulnerable maybe not know the law maybe more fearful or scared about what's going on not knowing what the police are supposed to do and so as she also talks about how black women or black girls are viewed as women right like the childhood aspect and we there's tons of scholars who are talking about this um, but how like you know your childhood is like robbed from you and you're viewed as more of an adult when interacting with the law at such an early age that many other communities and, and white folks generally don't have those same experiences, like a privilege in that of like being viewed as a child and treated as such versus um, uh, us in the black community. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, that, I urge you all to like check out. There's so much, you know, other things in the article um, that she addressed talking just about who's uh, which kind of you know, black women who are most susceptible to like police violence or, you know, black women with mental health issues. Um, definitely younger black women, of course, for the reasons I just said, um, who are likely to, you know, experience a lot of these things more so than than other groups. And again, only 4% of cases um, of police brutality or police violence in this capacity were like uh, lethal shootings and stuff happen to women in general. And 20% of those cases, though, happen to black women. Um, and there are tons of different places where black women almost make up 50% of the arrest um, in populations where only about 13% of the population or 15% of the population. So mm. because of things like the war on drugs and uh, the increase of like being more punitive on nonviolent offenses, mm -hmm. uh, one of the biggest factors we sweep begin to sweep, we swept so many black women and marginalized women um, into the criminal justice system who really didn't have that kind of criminal justice contact before. So these laws do matter. And this is provides incentive for law enforcement to engage with black women, right? If they feel like maybe not for a violent offense, but hey, they're 
legally able to stop them if they have suspect them of drug use and drugs or what have you. And I'm sure other things like prostitution and stuff like that. Sex work is another big rationale reason why police probably look to stop people. And these are things just to know how they all tie in together, how these major policies have actually, you know, increased the contact between black women and law enforcement. Yeah. Um, that don't do more harm than good. Yeah. I was looking at that, just how, you know, black women are disproportionately uh, in contact or, you know, arrested by or have these experiences. But one, you know, I, I don't know if there's something else you want to talk about before we kind of give some of these good? same say or name stories. But, mm-hmm. you know, you talked about like, being in contact and the story that came to mind for me uh, was Frankie Ann Perkins, who um, died at the hands of police on March 22nd, 1997. And what was interesting or so sad about this case is that uh, Frankie was walking home one evening and the police stopped her and, you know, they claimed that they observed her swallowing drugs and they tried to force her to, I guess, spit it out, um, which resulted in them essentially strangling her to death. Um, and that mm-hmm. was that claim was consistent with the autopsy report. No drugs were ever found, but it just thinking about like how, you know, these contacts, th- these enforcement efforts that are impacting black women, just just how aggressive they are. And it was it was it was something that you said that just made me think of that story and how it's like how like the war on drugs and like these stereotypes shape police interactions with black women that lead to an outcome like this. Oh yeah. Um We've changed, you know, policing became more like um, pseudo, like military. And and that's what I talk to my students about all the time. I was just like, I had to really think about what it means. When we say a war on something, um, we see what's going on right now, right? In Russia and Ukraine, that's that's a war, right? Uh, and so when we use these this language in our politics, and then now folks pass policies about a war on crime, a war on drugs, so the military gets armed, like they're going to war. It's like, okay, who are you actually about to attack? And yes, nine times out of 10 is going to be a person of color, as we've seen historically throughout um, our nation's history. And so, yeah, the, these tactics are super aggressive, super assertive, and we don't really need it to get someone who has drugs in their home, right? To get someone who's using drugs. The drug is not going to kill someone. You can't pick up a bag of weed and throw it at somebody and it's going to kill them. Like that's these kind of tactics just don't make sense. Um, but because of the the political language we use, the folks find it okay. Oh yeah, we are at a war. We are trying to take these and stop these criminals, quote unquote criminals. And then now we get these kind of aggressive tactics that increase the odds of these lethal engagements that we've been seeing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I agree. So, I mean, um, you also mentioned that there were some stories that you came across um, any that you feel like, you know, you want to say her name? Yeah. Um, Ayanna Stanley Jones. Um, you know, this one, uh, she was a seven year old, uh, girl who, um, was in Detroit, mm-hmm. lived in Detroit and, uh, was shot and killed, uh, in her sleep on a raid on her grandmother's home in her grandmother's home. Right. So we see this similar thing with like Brianna Taylor and we've seen others as well. Um, and, uh, the officer, you know, pulled the trigger, he said accidentally uh, with the girl's grandmother and then reported that it hit the uh, um, Ayana. Um, and so this officers actually tried twice and cleared of all charges as recently up until 2015. And so this is get like, I know we hear about these other cases uh, when we hear uh, these more popularized cases that have been happening these past few years. But again, this is a 2010 story that we know nothing about and about these police raids, as we're talking about, and these aggressive tactics. And then now innocent life is taken. And then the law enforcement officer gets no um, punishment or there's no punitive damages, et cetera, for this and actually can continue to work. This officer weekly was actually able to go back to work in April 2015. Um, so again, this is like, you see how this history and these kind of stories repeat themselves, but going back to our policing tactics, how we just need to have so many different changes because 
if you do this and take a life of a seven year old mm, so and can sad. go right back to work, mm-hmm. like come on, that that's that's just like what other countries do stuff like this? I don't know. America be wild with stuff like that. Yeah, that was one of the things that you know, as I was looking through some of the cases, like seeing that there is often zero accountability, zero mm-hmm. consequences. Um, you think about like the Rakia Boyd case where the off-duty officer shot her in the back of the head and he was cleared of all charges by a, a judge. Um, I, I feel like the only thing I did see was sometimes like the city settling with the family for mm-hmm. money. Mm-hmm. But it's like, who's paying for that? The taxpayer. <laughs> yes, us. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking, uh, or there was one case, um, or, or there are a few cases actually, you know, dating back to the eighties, uh, and Mm. nineties that I thought was really interesting. So there was this case, um, in the Bronx in 1984, where a 66 year old grandmother was being evicted from her home because she was four months behind you would be amazed at what her rent was at the time. Mm. Can you guess? Uh, I'm, you said 60, what, what years 66 was 66 years old, 80, uh, it was 1984. Oh man, I, I'm going to say $400. <laughs> I, yeah, it, it might have been a rent control uh, apartment because our mm-hmm. monthly rent was $98. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she was four months behind and getting convicted. I mean, getting evicted over that. And, Mm. you know, when she refused to open the doors, when the police officers came, um, there was like uh, they broke into the apartment or bust the door down. There was a struggle and she was shot twice with a 12 gauge shotgun. Wow. 66 year old, 66 years old. So one thing that I noticed about these, like you can try to like criminalized you can try to like stereotype like but the cases range from like seven-year-olds that are sleeping to like 92 year old grandma because there was this case in atlanta um I, i think it was atlanta yeah atlanta where um undercover police officers shot and killed a 92 year old woman in a botched drug raid i think they had like a incorrect tip or something that said that like there were like drugs being run out of the house. That wasn't the case. When the police officers like attempted to enter the home, like the grandma, you know, fired around, but didn't hit anybody. But after that, they fired 39 shots into her house and to cover up wow. what they did, they actually planted drugs, marijuana and cocaine, but they were found out. <sighs> And That's I would crazy. say this is this is one case where there were, actually were consequences because all three officers were charged and received sentences ranging from like five years to 10 years related to conspiracy. Two of them received involuntary manslaughter charges. And then the city also settled for four point eight million dollars. But, you know, mm. seven years old to 92 years old sleeping. You could be sleeping. Mm-hmm. You could you could be driving while black. It doesn't matter. That's one thing. I noticed yep. across these cases. Oh yeah, it does not matter. Um, actually, I had my group in Newark yesterday. Um, you know, with the guys, I've been doing that for a few years, and um, one of the guys we were talking about policing, and one of the guys said, like, you know, he he posed an argument saying, um, "Hey, you know, part of this, the reason why police mess with us is because of what we do, and um, you know, if if we just." you know, kind of, you know, almost respectability pop. If we just behave appropriately, then, you know, they'll kind of leave us alone and we'll get on our way. And, you know, boy, oh boy, there's a lot of pushback on that one. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to have to agree with everyone else because, you know, uh, because he actually said 100% of the time, it'll be fine. I'm like, no, 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 sir. That is extremely inaccurate. And then we went through a few cases saying like, hey, look when people did absolutely nothing, one, and then even interactions where people tell the police, follow the police instructions, going to reach for a wallet or reach for their license, still get shot. Laying on the ground with a, um, a autistic patient saying, hey, he's autistic. We got no issues. Still getting shot. I'm like, so that, you know, you can't walk around the world believing those kind of those kind of things that literally, like you said, no matter what kind of situation, no matter what you do, sleeping, walking, talking, eating, uh, 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 lodging by their um, demands you can still end in this tragic way. 
That's the scary. Yes, thing. that is in entirely um, just terrifying. Mm hmm. Um, I got one one story that I mentioned because I think this is important because you you mentioned earlier about you know also intersectionality around things like sexuality and um, there's a study uh, not study um, a case uh, Dewana Johnson 2008 in Memphis um, who was a um, transgender woman and um, she was a black woman living in Memphis and you know I was dealing with a lot of things like drug addiction and drug issues and was trying to get into shelters but could never get into shelters because of um her status um you know they weren't allowing them into the shelters at this point in 2008 and then uh, she was arrested for prostitution uh one night um and even though there was no alleged con uh, client right it was she just there by herself and the officers were trying to mess with her um uh, the officers who were booking her um was found calling her you know the derogatory term um for um gay people we've seen about the f word i'm not gonna say it they were calling her a he she and um, and then she refused to like answer because I guess was trying to get her attention, but she wasn't answering to those really disrespectful terms. And then when they refused to answer, uh, the officer put on gloves and wrapped her um, in some handcuffs and um, and around uh, put her around his knuckles and then savagely beat her in the face wow. uh, while this other officer held her down and then pepper sprayed her on the floor and handcuffed that her. That is right? disturbing. And security video captured the entire incident right so these things is like it's like wild right like what in what world do we live in when law enforcement officers can do things like this um i think one of the officers actually got sentenced in two years um and i think the other officer nothing happened with um where both of them should have definitely been sentenced and you're killing someone only two years like that you know savagely beating someone like that unwarranted just because they didn't respond she to was your disrespectful killed. Names. she was killed yeah, she yeah, she eventually um, was found dead later on, shot execution style, which they haven't been directly connected with. But with that kind of behavior, I think, you know, we can we can draw some assumptions. Wow. Mm -hmm. So sad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I know we've had conversations about this before in the past um, with our own episodes and guests as well about just talking about, you know, uh, the black trans community and and how even more invisible those stories are as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we talked about um, kind of like no consequences, but there was another case of Maya Hill, a black transgender woman. Um, and in the case of, you know, being killed by police, there were no charges whatsoever for the officers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, this continuous cycle, right? And it's all these cases are like years and years ago, and we're still seeing, you know, having these same conversations today in 2022. So we got to figure out ways to do better and you know get some change in this in this world. Um, but that, yeah, that covers you know most of the things that I had. You know, we just want—I know we want to take time to just give some space and talk about these things, even in the midst when there's not like any major new stories surrounding it, you know, it's still to just re remind everybody and continue to raise awareness about, hey, these cases are probably still happening. And just because we don't hear about it doesn't mean they're not happening. And maybe we should do our part to, you know, um, either raise awareness or definitely talk about these things if we do see it a little more to get the attention of everyone else, like we would do if it was a black man. Agreed. Agreed. And highlighting these stories does not take away from anything else. If anything, we need to be fighting for more coverage in general mm -hmm. so that everybody's stories receive attention and we're not fighting over the minutes and seconds that they're willing to give our stories and our narratives in popular mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. Agreed. Agreed. Um, OK, um, you know, good. So hopefully I took some away from this and. Um, you know, shed a lot of light, shed a little bit of light on this. This is, you know, what we're here for, just to drop some information and some resources. Uh, like that said, I'm sure she'll put some of these, couple of these links on there for you all to look and peruse through yourself, which I really strongly urge you all to do because these kind of conversations are really, really important. Um, outside of that, if you haven't yet, follow us on social media at BHD Podcast. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can visit our website, blackandhighlandangerous.com, queue up all our latest content. You can also look at us on YouTube where we start having visual content on there now. So you can check us out and check up on all the latest clips on our YouTube page, Black and Highly Dangerous. 
And you can also email us, bhcpodcast at gmail.com. You have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas, would like to be a guest, hit us up. We'd love to hear from you all, and we do love responding to you all. And then um, if you haven't yet, review and rate us on iTunes and on YouTube as well. Drop some comments and some likes. That really helps with the algorithms so that more people can find us. So please, 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 if you haven't, do that. Um, You'll be doing your part to help support this podcast for free. And then after you do all that, share us with your friends, share us with your family, share us with your enemies, and as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics, and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.